Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar on resettlement and impact assessment points of intersection. My name is Bridget John and I work for IAIA, the International Association for Impact Assessment. We are very pleased to be hosting this webinar for you today. A few quick pieces of housekeeping before we begin our content. The slides from today are available for download from our GoToWebinar control panel. And we are also recording this webinar, and it will be made available to you by email next week. So watch for that to come into your inbox. We do plan for time at the end for questions. Please feel free to enter your questions at any time into the questions box um, in your control panel for GoToWebinar. And uh, we'll be moderating those at the end. Uh, so at this point, let me introduce our speaker. We're very pleased to have Liz Wall. She's an independent consultant with more than 15 years of global experience addressing and, and assessing social impacts that are associated with large projects in developing countries, almost all of which have generated some level of resettlement. As a former IFC social specialist, she's an ex expert in the implementation of the IFC performance standards, and she's worked in over 40 countries. So without further ado, Liz, I will turn the presentation over to you. Thanks, Bridget, and thank you everyone for, for joining us. Um, today we're obviously going to talk about resettlement and impact assessment. Uh, both these topics are broad in the extreme, and to try and do either of them justice in their entirety in a 40-minute or 45-minute discussion wouldn't work. So instead, what I'm trying to look at is where resettlement and impact assessment intersect. Quite often, I think, uh, people who specialize in resettlement tend to specialize in resettlement and those in impact assessment and impact assessment. And sometimes the worlds don't overlap as much as they could. I think there are plenty of opportunities where a little bit more alignment and possibly a better understanding between the two specialties could lead to some improved outcomes. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to start with a basic discussion of the principles of resettlement. Um, from looking at the, the registration for this uh, topic tonight, clearly a lot of people on this call have had a lot of experience with resettlement and plenty have had a lot of experience with impact, ass um, impact assessment. But we're going to go through the basic ideas of resettlement just to make sure that we're all starting from the same page. We'll then go through a series of points where impact assessment and resettlement intersect. Now, this list that I've got on here is by no means comprehensive. Um, uh, there are many other features that we could focus on. But from the work that I do with various clients, these are the sorts of issues that people often come to me to talk about. Um, and I think there's, there's good examples that we can find in each of them where possibly there can be a bit of shared understanding between the two specialties. It is worth pointing out at this point that this is not going to be a entirely technical academic discussion. This is going to be a discussion based very much on cases um, from around the world, from projects that I personally know or know others who worked with. The cases have been, no way, there's been an attempt to anonymize them because the point is not to say that one has done well or one has not done so well, but rather to provide some context and some flavor to how these things play out in reality. So from an impact assessment intersection point of view, we'll firstly look at project design, then we'll move through baseline studies, um, surveys and census from the perspectives of both timing and context. We'll then address the meat of the impact assessment from sort of obviously the impacts themselves, the commitments that are made in impact assessments and the management measures that get put up to, to then manage those impacts. And then we'll conclude just with a little comment on some of the intersections between cumulative impacts and resettlement, which can sometimes be overlooked. So starting from the beginning, what is the definition of involuntary resettlement? Well, the most common definition that's used is that provided by the IFC. Um, they define involuntary resettlement as being both physical displacement, so referring to the relocation or loss of shelter, so imagine this is the loss of a house in its most simple form, and economic displacement, which is the loss of access to assets that leads to a loss of income sources and other means of livelihood. Now, to put some flavor on that, that could be the loss of the fields on which you grow your crops. It could be the loss of access to the marine resources where you catch your harvest. It could be the loss of your shop where you ply your trade. Now, obviously, for resettlement to occur, there is normally a land access or a land acquisition process which precedes this as a first step. I think it's pretty typical to refer to this as a summed up unit of land access and resettlement. And while I certainly uh, and totally endorse that way of describing it, 
for the purposes of today, rather than saying four words every time, I'm just going to call it resettlement and assume that everybody knows that I mean the bigger picture of all the steps that are involved. Now, before we get too much further, I think we probably all have a certain set of images in our head when we think of resettlement. Um, I, this first image is, is possibly one that many would, would immediately go to. Uh, it will be familiar to many, I'm sure. This is a very typical site. This one on a particularly, is particularly from a mining project in Guinea. It was a resettlement village that was constructed where you can see there's a number of houses. Okay, you can only see three in this photo, but believe me that there were many more. Um, the houses were of a fairly similar design that accommodated different numbers of bedrooms based on the size of the house that people had before they moved. That, and, and I should explain, the two individuals in the photo are responsible for the construction of quite a few of these houses and are good friends of mine. So this we would probably all be quite familiar with. The second, this issue, this image is from Democratic Republic of Congo. And again, it represents something that a number of people will probably be familiar with, the highly geometric, possibly not too natural, uh, resettlement village that was planned by, a, again, a mining project um, for their new community's location. This third image is a resettlement site again. This one is in Vietnam. In this particular case, the community um, who were resettled were paid their compensation in cash um, based on the value of the land and the assets and houses that they had on their land. And of course, when they moved to the new resettlement site, they could use that money as they saw appropriate. So some people built big houses, some people built small houses, some people decided to leave a block free so that they could plant a garden, etc., etc. And as anyone who's worked in Vietnam will probably attest, you know that a community has started to settle in when they start playing badminton in the middle of the street. This next image is a time series, and it takes a little bit of explanation. This map that you can see, or well, these images you can see, represent a period over, of just over 80 years. Um, so we've got 2018 up in the top left and 2100 down in the bottom right. And this image is actually showing the city of Kiruna in northern Sweden. It's above the Arctic Circle. Kiruna is a mining town that first started um, mining back in 1900. It was designed to be a mining town. And as the images are trying to demonstrate, the density of population is currently located on the western edge of the city, so where the red centres are. As the mine has progressed over the last 100 years, they've realised that the mineralisation extends underneath the location of the city, and they now want to resettle the city of Kiruna. Now, this is going to be a long process, and over the next roughly 80 years, they will slowly move the centre of population and the density of population from the west to the east. So you can see the red centre is moving across and it's only a distance of about 2 k's and it will be done gradually but it's a quite an undertaking. And to give you some context, this is Kiruna. Um, so the purpose of these slides is really, um, and these images, is really to remind us all that resettlement happens in rich countries and poor and everything in between. It happens in urban areas, in semi-urban or peri-urban areas, in rural areas. There are any number of varieties of resettlement um, and context is exceptionally important. However, overlying this whole issue of context, there, is, uh, there are a series of principles which we'll shortly discuss which allow you to provide some level of um, planning to how you go to about resettlement. So while the context should drive the detail, the principles should drive the approach. So what are these principles? Well, primarily they're the international standards and guidelines. So a key of these is the RFC performance standard number five on involuntary resettlement. Um, and this is what we'll be talking, sort of referencing, I suppose, most of today. Recently, the World Bank brought out their environmental and social standard number five, which is also on um, resettlement. And then as well, there's the Asian Development Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, African Development Bank, and the Japan Bank for International Cooperation, to name only a few, who also have guidelines um, and standards on involuntary resettlement. But what are the principles that they are asking us to live up to? Well, the first is, we'll go through these one by one, but the first is really to avoid resettlement wherever possible and where avoidance is not possible, to minimise that displacement, so both physical and economic displacement, 
by exploring alternative project designs. So basically they're asking us to try and generate projects which can avoid the need to displace people economically or physically or both. The second item is that we should be avoiding forced eviction. Now this is a really important topic. We don't have time to talk about it today, so I'm going to park it out there as something for future interest for other people to talk about, um, but not to diminish in any sense the importance of the issue. It's just not so relevant for where I'm taking today's conversation. The next is we need to anticipate and avoid, or where avoidance is not possible, minimise the social and economic impacts from land acquisition or restrictions on land use. And there are really two ways we can do this. The first is by providing compensation for loss of assets at replacement cost. And the second is that we ensure that the resettlement activities are implemented with appropriate disclosure of information, consultation, and the informed participation of those affected. So if you were thinking of it really, we make sure we compensate people a fair value. Um, then that's not the wording to be used, but it's an easy way to think of it. And secondly, that we do this with their full cooperation and consent to the extent that we can. Um, and coordination and participation with them. Now, even when you do that, what are you aiming to achieve? Well, the objective is to improve, um, hopefully, or at very least restore, the livelihoods and standards of living of, of displaced persons. And for those who are physically displaced, we should be aiming to make sure that adequate housing is provided and that that housing has a security of tenure which can be confirmed at the new resettlement site. So what that really is getting us to say is that are we comfortable and confident that the place that we've moved someone to is not subsequent going to be um, at risk of having to be moved again. So those are the, standard, the, the objectives that are outlined in IFC Performance, five, Performance Standards 5. Now, as I probably will say too many times during today, there is a lot of detail in here and each one of these aspects we could easily spend a webinar talking about. But for the purpose of today, I just want to share them to make sure that we all have these in mind when we then think about what does that mean in the context of where resettlement and impact assessment overlap. Before we get to that point, though, in case anybody is currently thinking, my goodness, there's a lot going on in that, how are we going to handle it all? There are a lot of really useful resources out there. So anyone who's looking to be a resettlement practitioner, you definitely want to have a look at the handbook um, for preparing a wrap, which was prepared by the IFC 14, 15 years ago. Now it's still as relevant as it was then. Secondly, the ADB have also prepared a good practice source book, which provides lots of useful help. Then there's some others which I would suggest having a look at. So this one is a book um, of oral testimonies that is prepared uh, regarding, well, related to the human cost of development and resettlement. So it looks at the experience of communities who have been resettled in projects around the world and how their experience of resettlement has impacted them. It's a good reminder of what we're doing and the very human cost that it has, or uh, human impact. The next one is probably the most recent. So the International Council on Mining and Metals, or ICMM, recently released uh, these lessons learned. Um, these are freely available on their website, and while they are specific to mining, there's a lot of lessons in here that you can apply unilaterally across different fields. And finally, to anyone who's going to do this in practice, the book written by Jerry Reddy, Eddie Smith and Michael Stein is hard to pass up. I think you'd definitely want it in your back pocket if you're about to embark on a resettlement project. This isn't to suggest by any stretch that these are the only resources out there, but there's certainly some that I'd recommend. So taking a step back, why does resettlement matter so much from a project perspective? Well, unanticipated or poorly planned resettlement can lead to a, a combination of things. Um, firstly, it can lead to delays. Um, we've probably all seen situations where either land access and resettlement hasn't occurred on the time scale that it was anticipated and project construction has been delayed. And then normally associated with a delay is a cost. Secondly, if resettlement is handled poorly um, or late, uh, it can lead to impacts on community will and uh, goodwill and support that can long, have a long-term um, impact on the ability for the community and the project to interact. One of the cases we'll look at later in Peru really does highlight this point that even where the impact was caused possibly by a company that was involved in the project earlier, that legacy stays with you. And I guess from a third point of view, there's an issue that can come up if projects are seeking financing. 
uh, typically financiers, particularly so say equator bank financing, will look at projects that have the need, the potential for resettlement to occur as projects that have an increased risk profile. Um, this is normally because you don't have quite the same sense of certainty around the schedule, the cost, and the possible loss of social license or possible impacts to social license when you have resettlement simply because it, it isn't something that's as easily to be controlled. In addition to this, there is always the public eye. Now, we all know projects, whether they be state funded or private funded, have the potential to fall into the, private, the public eye for very many reasons. Resettlement is one of them. Um, it can become a very hot topic and vocalised extremely well and articulated well by critics and NGOs um, as necessary, sometimes for very good reasons, sometimes for perceived but not actually realised impacts. These two examples here, one is from Danwatch and one is a Bankwatch report. The point is not to uh, particularly highlight the projects that they issue, but rather to remind us all that when resettlement doesn't work, it doesn't work often in a very public way. But before we go too far, there is obviously a second side to this story. So from a project perspective, resettlement has a, has a huge impact, potentially. But from a community perspective, it has an even bigger impact. The, the slide below here, or the slide we're looking at, actually pictures the Tabula Dam. Now, there's any number of projects I could have picked um, from around the world. The Tabula Dam, obviously, and I'm sure all of us are at least a little bit familiar with it. It was a, an enormous dam that was built in the 70s in northwestern Pakistan. The construction of that dam required the resettlement of 96,000 people. Um, taking 82,000 acres of land and affecting about 120 villages. Now, those statistics, depending which source, you'll find variations on those numbers, but those numbers come from a recent World Bank um, assessment that was done. The resettlement was completed in 1985, but started in the early 70s. These two quotes are really intended to, to share with, or to remind us all, I guess, of the very human consequence um, of resettlement, and especially if it's not done so well. So I'm just going to read them. A public meeting was going on in the school. The Tabila Dam was being constructed. It was some politician, I still remember his words, it will ruin your coming generations. I was at a loss to understand. I was young, I couldn't get the hang of it. But now, at the age of 47, I clearly understand the wisdom in what he said. We are all scattered. If one uncle is in Punjab, the others are elsewhere, having no communication with one another. And our generation, it's badly affected. And our next generations too. That man was right. And secondly, we had our own culture and customs. We had a set way of life. All that has been disturbed. I still dream of those orchard streets and fields. We are living in this township now for more than 27 years, but we never dream about this area. We will always remember that place. And again, the point of this is not to particularly highlight the Tabula Dam, but just to use it as a, as a good memory stone of why we really need to think carefully about what we're doing with resettlement and the very human implication that resettlement has. Now, we've covered really the basics of resettlement. So let's look at where resettlement and impact assessment first collide normally, hopefully in a good way. The project design. Now, I realise a lot of people on this call have a background in impact assessment, so I think we would all be well across the idea that early involvement of social and environmental specialists can improve and inform project design to minimise project impacts. A really good example of this uh, was seen in a project in Armenia where they developed a site alternatives analysis matrix covering a variety of topics. So the project was looking to site a facility that realistically it could be put anywhere. It was, it was a mining project, but this particular facility was not um, constrained in terms of where it needed to be. It wasn't part of the pit, which obviously had to be tied to the geology of the area. It was a waste rock dump. So the factors that would be taken into consideration were everything from the, the distance that it would have to, material would have to be hauled, whether the area had any kind of biodiversity value, whether it had archaeological value, and including whether or not it was going to cause or how much economic displacement it was causing, how much physical displacement it would cause. And all of these things were put into a matrix to allow for an informed choice around where to put the facility in a way that, of course, 
it ended up being a compromise. Uh, you can't have 28 different factors being considered without a compromise, but it was a compromise that was an informed compromise. So while we're here, Bridget, can I ask you to put the first polling question up, please? Okay, if everybody can give their answer on this, and then we'll see where everybody comes up. Oh, right. Sorry. Here we go. Yeah. Okay, so I'm still learning the technology here. Well, it seems that 60% of us decided that we would um, go with the physical and economic displacement rather than the no physical displacement, with only 40% opting for no physical displacement but some economic displacement. This is quite an interesting phenomenon in that uh, I guess I certainly have heard many times on many projects an almighty sigh of relief when you hear someone say, yes, we have a big project, but don't worry, there's no physical displacement that's going to occur. And instead we end up with the quandary that possibly the physical displacement was avoided by affecting um, more people's fields and more people have ended up being economically displaced. If you go back to the basic principles, you can often end up feeling like this is the right decision, and in some cases it may well be. But I would urge caution um, when looking at these sorts of decisions because as a practice from a resettlement point of view, we're typically, uh, I think, a little better at managing physical displacement than we are addressing the long-term impacts of economic displacement. As a field of study, we've still got a long way to go to really know how to um, restore livelihoods and do it in a time-sensitive manner. So let's move on. Right, what's the next aspect of project design that where these two issues can overlap? This one is a, is a case in Guinea. Um, it's again a mining project and it's a project where satellite pits um, are developed. So the original impact assessment looked at the whole concession, it's a large concession, and the particular geology of this area means that many, many small satellite pits are developed on a piecemeal process and really the only planning that goes through is the mine planning process. So while there was no doubt involvement in the original impact assessment um, process to identify the social and environmental concerns, these concerns can sometimes be missed, particularly resettlement concerns, when it comes to the day-to-day -day mine planning. So you can often end up with a situation where the mine planning group needs to be sure that they are engaging with resettlement people and the social and environmental teams to fully appreciate whether the small satellite that they are going to mine that may last for a year or two is really worth the social consequence of resettling an entire village um, long term. Not to say that it isn't, but it's definitely necessary to do the assessment to figure it out. Staying with project design, we, we all use the mantra in resettlement that avoidance is always the most appropriate option. Sometimes I think this is worth questioning, um, not to suggest that we should be moving people unnecessarily, but the case that I have, and my apologies for the rather poor drawing skills um, on the right, but I, I wanted to just give you the idea and somehow it looks a little bit like Fred Flintstone, but anyway, hopefully you'll forgive me. This is taken from a, a project in Vietnam where within Vietnam communes, um, villages report to a commune and a commune is the level at which um, basic services are provided. So hospitals um, and health clinics and education centres, police, all of these things are provided at the commune level that then serve villages. In this particular case the commune had six villages in it and five of those villages needed to be resettled. The sixth village was left in place, which certainly met the intent of the avoid where possible um, criteria. However, as a result, the rest of the five villages moved 20 kilometers away from the original location of the commune, totally stranding this sixth village, such that for them to try and get police support, they had to go 20 kilometers. For them to get their kids to school, they needed to start talking to different people in different communes and try and find exemptions to allow them to access these resources. So 
I'm not suggesting there's a simple answer with this, but rather just suggesting that we all look at these things and recognize that sometimes even the interpretation of these overarching principles is made complex when you start looking at the detail. Another issue that, that I often um, see on projects is where you have so much economic displacement that you actually force physical displacement to occur, or potentially force physical displacement to occur. An example of this was a port project in Guinea which needed to assess whether the economic displacement impacts they'd caused to a series of communities was of a, such a scale that it was going to be impossible for those communities to continue residing there. So in this context, the houses of these community members were not going to be affected. The house would still stand there. But in this particular case, they were a rice growing community and the real question was, would they still be able to grow enough rice to sustain their, their lives um, while living in their houses or would they need to find a new house somewhere else where they could gain new access to new rice growing fields. Moving on, Oops. the second part of our, our topic actually and we'll now run the second poll. So if everybody can answer this question um, and hopefully I'll be a bit quicker in, uh, in, answer, in getting us back on. <laughs> Okay, hopefully everybody caught up. So, this second question was really, can you collect the same information that you need for resettlement and for baseline surveys for impact assessments at the same time? And I can report that 78% of you said yes, with 22% saying no. I would totally agree with you. However, I would say it's a yes but. Uh, and the but is really, and of course I didn't give you the option of having a yes but, so apologies for that. But the point is really that uh, in order to make this work um, and to make it efficient, you would very much want to do these surveys, um, the, the baseline surveys once. The confusion and the, uh, the difficulty can come from the fact that the timing of resettlement and impact assessment data collection are not always aligned. Um, there's many a case where you'll see the impact assessment process is progressing but the resettlement isn't actually going to occur until later when the project has greater certainty or whether they're really going to have a project that has passed feasibility. Um, because very often, of course, the impact assessment and the feasibility are charging along, hopefully, in an integrated and interconnected um, period but often resettlement decisions don't happen until further along the feasibility process when there's greater project certainty. Secondly, the baseline data that you need to collect is obviously very similar, but there are some monitoring and evaluation requirements that you're going to need from the baseline data from a resettlement pers perspective that can be missed if you're looking at it from the view of simply um, impact assessment. And this we'll come back to in a minute, but uh, I guess an additional point is really that the area of influence that you're looking at from a resettlement perspective is normally quite different and much smaller, or hopefully much smaller, than the area of influence that you're looking for at an impact assessment level. So sometimes that means you need different surveys, sometimes you need different density of surveying, um, but it all needs to go into the consideration of the planning for the baseline survey. And finally on that point, Information coding becomes key. Um, I, there's a project I know reasonably well, well in Papua New Guinea which collected an enormous amount of data across an enormous area, um, all of which was very useful. Unfortunately, however, it wasn't possible to then go back and determine whether the person who provided the information, the household for which the information applied, had actually been physically or economically displaced or was simply a member um, of the community in general which then made it quite hard from a monitoring and evaluation perspective to determine whether or not resettlement impacts had been addressed. So I guess the point is simply to say, yes, definitely try and avoid survey fatigue wherever you can, but coordination is key. Um, oops. The next piece is really, are you asking the right questions? Um, now, I don't want to teach anyone to sack eggs. Um, we all know the value of baseline studies and being able to provide a control against uh, against future change or against which future change can be measured. But I would probably suggest that there are a few areas where this is as critical um, as, the, as it is in resettlement. 
Now, the photo below shows or is from a resettlement site in Mozambique. Uh, on top of the uh, granary building is some maize. And that maize has been harvested and it's now being dried on the top of the roof, which is pretty typical. Prior to resettlement, a huge amount of information was collected on this community, who are at least partially uh, an agricultural community, or majority agricultural community, about how many or how much maize, how many beans, how many different crops and how the volumes of those crops that was being harvested, so that this could then be used in the future um, once they were settled in their new location to compare um, and to give some level of indication as to how livelihood restoration was progressing. However, the information was recorded as this household produced two bushels, and that household produced one basin of beans and one tractor load of maize, and this household produced two truckfuls of maize, and that household produced two sacks worth of something else. The level of detail in the information was fantastic. Unfortunately, the units had absolutely no commonality, um, and some man's basin was not necessarily the same as his neighbours, nor was the size of his tractor, nor was the size of the donkey cart. And so while the data was there, um, unfortunately, it proved to be uh, a lot less useful than it should have been. The, this next piece of who's actually affected, um, this is a, obviously the classic impact assessment question and likewise resettlement planning question. But there needs to be an iterative discussion between these two processes. Uh, it's very typical to think of resettlement as being linked to project footprint, um, in which case it doesn't feel as if the iterations should be so grave. But of course there are plenty of examples where other factors, other impacts actually influence the need for resettlement. So for example noise and dust. There's a, a case in Armenia where literally in the last weeks of a very, very long impact assessment process was finally realised that, and for the whole time this project had been delighted to be able to say that while they were causing economic displacement, they were not expecting to cause any physical displacement. And with weeks to go, that fell over because it turned out one household um, was, so, was sufficiently close to a facility such that the noise and the dust requirements were not going to be met. And that was the reason why they needed to be physically displaced. The connected to this is this idea of how do you know who is affected um, and will you know based on when you conducted the survey. These next photos, so the first, this is an image of uh, the same project site in Armenia. This is winter. Um, you would look at this and actually further into winter there's a lot less that you can see, but imagine just more and more snow. But you could look at this area and think that it's fairly underutilised and that it doesn't have particular, particular use for anybody. Look at it again in the summer, suddenly you get a very different view. Um, admittedly, this is not quite the same image, but I promise it's almost standing and looking in the opposite direction. The whole area is that green. It suddenly looks like fantastic pasture. And lo and behold, in summertime, herders travel from actually northwestern Iran and travel up to come and use the summer pasture and have been for over a hundred years. Just reminding us that when you do a survey um, has a massive impact on what you see and who you think is affected. This is probably even more dramatic when you take the case of Mongolian nomadic herders. Um, Mongolian herders typically have a number of camps during the year. Um, their winter camp and sometimes also their spring camp uh, are legally recognised as as residences effectively, um, for want of a better expression, while their summer um, and autumn camps tend to, to move depending on where the pastures are. The trick is of course to recognise a winter camp when you see it, when it's not winter. This is a winter camp seen in uh, late, well late summer actually. Now the, the two marks that you can see on the ground um, are actually animal dung um, and they are significant because the animal dung provides an insulation layer between the frozen earth and the animals when winter comes. So the point is not to say that everybody needs to learn how to recognise a Mongolian winter herder camp but rather that the context of where you are and recognising what you're looking at is incredibly um, sensitive to location. So the next piece of the puzzle is really around timing. Um, I hinted at this earlier that the timing of decisions 
uh, around resettlement and impact assessment um, can become complicated. From a mining perspective, many companies want to hold off acquiring land and resettling people until they're confident the project's going to proceed, which you can understand. But equally, they need to manage the risk of not being able to acquire the land um, or an increased cost or time in the event that the project then proceeds. So on the one hand, there, there's a risk balance to be factored in. Both there's a number of risks for the company, but there's also a risk of is the company wearing the risk or the community wearing the risk or in the company you can replace government or whoever the entity is who's holding off on resettlement. There's a, the, the case I want to talk about is a Peruvian mining concession. This particular mining concession has been held by three different owners. Uh, the first was a company who owned the concession between 1993 and 99. And during that time, they acquired something like 2,600 hectares of land. Um, and uh, reputedly, the land acquisition process back then involved some coercive tactics, um, including the closing of schools and hospitals to, uh, I think in air quotes, encourage people to accept the compensation deal um, and leave the area. And about half of the community did leave the area at that time and moved to the coast. But not so long after that, a second company came in. They looked at the project for about a year and then concluded that they didn't think the project was likely to be developed. Um, and so went through a process of trying to undergo social closure, whereby they tried to, well, they, yeah, they tried to sell the land that had been acquired, the 2,600 hectares, back to um, the community who had been displaced um, at a much uh, lower cost so that the communities would have a chance to buy back in. And about half of the community who had been, who had sold land, bought their land back. Enter the third company. They were very excited when they got this concession. It was a number of years had passed. Um, they felt that this concession had great potential and put on what they call their company fast track. Um, it then went through a period of of significant expansion from a project point of view and the company started leasing land rather than purchasing um, and they also made a temporary relocation of about 21 families to site a, a water treatment plant. A couple of years later the global financial crisis hit and the project went from having about 1500 employees at the beginning of the year to 200 at the end of the year and as you would imagine all activity on the resettlement front quietened down. So over the next few years, the third company continued to review their approach and look at how they'd done things and really the situation they were in, realising that by this stage they were very much um, living in the history of, or living with the legacy of what had gone before them, a very dysfunctional resettlement at first, a community who realised that uh, when the balance of risk between company and community was being judged, it always seemed as if the community were the ones paying and some decisions which had been maybe not as well planned out as they could have been along the way. So this point is really to say, uh, while it is understandable that projects go through up and down cycles of are they going to go ahead, are they not, um, to the extent that we can we should be protecting communities from experiencing and from being on the sharp end of those changes of policy. And secondly, that you always live with the legacy of all that has gone before you which is a nice segue to our next slide, talking about some other legacy impacts. So again, a project in Vietnam where prior to the resettlement project, prior to a private sector-led resettlement project, government had gone in and cleared an area um, in order to create an economic zone. The clearance of this area, which had required about 600 households moving, um, had been done according to government principles, but there were a few issues that were outstanding. And quite quickly, the private sector um, connected resettlement realised that for them to have a successful resettlement program, they were really going to have to resolve the issues of the earlier resettlement so that the community could come back to a level of, of peace. Um, secondly, there was a, and possibly on the flip side, in uh, the same project we were looking at before in Armenia, a village had been resettled um, as part of a, a government relocation many years earlier in order to develop a hydropower project. Now this village, while it was in proximity to the mining project, was not expected ever to need to be physically displaced. It was a number of kilometres from the sites and the facilities, but the hopes of this village were extraordinary that they would be resettled because they had never been satisfied with the location they'd been put in 
after the government required resettlement. And so a huge part of this particular project was managing the expectations of being resettled um, to understand that actually that wasn't going to happen. Um, and in order for community harmony to be maintained, that was the issue that needed to be addressed rather than, rather than some of the others you might have originally conceived of. This, this next example is really to be conscious of the unresolved conflicts that sit around. Uh, I'm using an example that's from well, both the Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea. It would apply equally, it does apply equally in both. I think it's the most natural thing in the world when you sit down from an impact assessment point of view or a resettlement point of view to pull out a map and start asking questions about who lives where and which land belongs to which and where's the boundary between this person's land or this tribe's land and the next tribe's land. And in many contexts that is absolutely the appropriate thing to do. And in some contexts it isn't. Um, so instead you end up having very general conversations about the history of land use in order to avoid inflaming existing tensions or unresolved conflicts. Drawing on to the next point. So the impact assessment commitments that we actually make and write into impact assessments. Let's just take a step back for a second. So the details of resettlement um, plans and commitments are normally captured in a resettlement action plan if it's physical displacement or a livelihood restoration plan if it's just economic displacement. So this is where you expect to find the, let's say, the meat of, of all the management issues. But it is pretty common that impact assessments also have to be developed in advance of a RAP or an LRP. And so the impact assessment itself has to make some general comments on how resettlement is going to be handled. Some, and, and I guess I would actually say probably many of the impact assessments that you see put a series of principles in place that are the stellar principles. No one would question them. But the practicality of the principles can come into question when you start trying to implement some of these projects. One example is the statement that willing buyer, willing seller transactions only will be applied. Um, the, the little image off to the right here shows the footprint of, in orange, of a facility that needs to be put in place. Now, all of the land that you can see within the orange footprint, people have agreed that they will either sell, um, so the purple and the green is all people have agreed to sell, and the areas that have remained orange aren't actually owned by anyone other than the commune. However, the little pesky red bits are uh, the plocks of land that are the holdout sellers. Um, now, obviously, if you're trying to put an orange-shaped facility in place and you have little blocks of red, you can't progress your project. You either have to find a new location or you need to do something different. So while willing buyer, willing seller transactions as a commitment is a brilliant thing to be able to say, it may not be practical in terms of what you actually end up achieving. Similarly, I think it's very common for us all to aspire to have only land for land or asset for asset compensation um, within the resettlement community. It's pretty widely accepted that you should always, and certainly IFC, always pushes to say that, that land for land or asset for asset is preferable over cash. But I think that's the terminology that we have to stay with, that it's preferable, but it's not to the exclusion of. Um, there are many cases that I've worked on where it is just simply not possible, um, and nor is it appropriate for some households to receive or communities to receive anything other than cash due to the change in circumstances which they will occur and how they want to, to change their lives post-displacement. The third piece of this really comes back to some of the time frames. Now, unfortunately, I can't wave my magic wand and say the right time for livelihood restoration is X. I wish I could. But more to say, just as a, a cautionary tale again, that very often the time frames for when it is expected that livelihoods will be restored, um, as noted in some of the impact assessment requirements, can often underestimate the amount of time that that takes. In addition to the commitments, there's the management measures which get suggested. Um, and they, this comment applies equally to uh, the resettlement action plans themselves and the impact assessments. It's some management measures end up being quite problematic to implement or sustain. So for example, there's been many a case where suggestions have been made to have dramatic changes in lifestyle um, as a means of restoring livelihoods. So you see this where you've got a community transitioning from one livelihood to another, such as fishing to land-based or 
farming to small trade or you name it, you can think of it, the uh, many cases in Asia with sort of densification and urbanisation, you see people who've been farmers now expected to have formal employment. This will work for certain sectors of society but it probably won't work for all sectors and it's just recognising the nuance of how likely it is to work for how many people and what backup plans you'll have for those that it, that it won't work for. I guess the second piece of that recommendation probably goes in the opposite direction which is that quite often you see um, plans that are maybe over specific in terms of what they say the anticipated new livelihood venture will be. Um, the image at the bottom I'm sure will be familiar to many. The classic, we're going to build a chicken farm and everybody in this community will become closet chicken farmers. Again, it works really well sometimes, but recognising that any suggested livelihood restoration program needs to be discussed in consultation with a community and, and recognising that not all of them will work sometimes being a bit less specific and a bit more open to how the process will go rather than the detail of exactly what you intend can be a wise move. Finally, I just want to have a, a little comment about cumulative impacts. Um, often by the time that cumulative impacts are being looked at, resettlement processes and impact assessment processes may well have separated quite a bit. They can be running along their own somewhat independent paths by this stage. And there's a number of times where they need to, to come back together. Um, so one example is in, in Guinea. Um, there's the bauxite region of Guinea known as Boke. It has checkerboard concessions. So one con where one concession ends, the next concession starts um, for many hundreds of kilometres north and south and east and west. So the land that is available when you say you need to resettle a community actually depends on the land that is available within your own concession. If you were to suggest that someone needs to be resettled outside your concession, then either they have to go hundreds of kilometres away, which would be completely unfeasible, or you put them in the position where they can't be given security of tenure because you're putting them in someone else's concession, which could subsequently require them to be resettled again. So you have a cumulative impact effect of the shortage of land that is available in some of these areas. A good example is actually seen also in Mozambique where the same issue caused a community to be resettled um, by the government, sorry the location was chosen by the government, 40 kilometres to the east of their original location. Um, they had been living on a riverside and they ended up moving to a, an area with no natural water source, um, or no flowing water source, sorry, with the reasoning being that, um, and this image actually to the right that you can see illustrates all the different mining licences in the Moatees district in Tet. Um, and it's pretty clear that where are you going to find somewhere that a village can be placed without it being at risk of future resettlement again. That actually brings us to the end of what I wanted to say. Um, my, my parting thoughts are really just that, that both resettlement and impact assessment are complex and they are time sensitive. Um, I think there are many opportunities to, to better align the work that is done by resettlement and impact assessment and particularly to make sure that the specialists in both fields have a, a stronger understanding of each other's fields so that we can collectively improve upon the, the output that we generate from each. Thank you very much and Bridget I'll hand back to you. Excellent, thank you very much Liz. Um, we do have a few questions and uh, the first one comes from Fernanda. Uh, sometimes we have to deal with a huge expectation created during the baseline survey. The chance to have some money with a compensation creates a desire to be resettled. But when we give the news to the family that they can stay in the same place, that could be bad news instead of good news in some contexts. Do you have any advice on how to deal with that? Uh, yeah, excellent question. Um, I think that's something that you see very often. Um, and you see it across, across a lot of things. So. The incentive to receive the cash, um, maybe actually the example that I was giving from Armenia is part of that same story that there's a desire to start your life again or particularly if you're the village that's the one that doesn't need to be resettled when a number of others do. Um, and I know this is an issue that's dealt with a lot in the development sector where you have refugee camps and you end up with a divergence between what a host community is dealing with and what um, a newly um, a right refugee community is dealing with, not to suggest that anyone is, is having fun at that time at all. Um, but you get this divergence of standards. Um, 
I think the in terms of having to address how you explain to people whether or not um, staying is better, the, the best example if you can is to take people to to another site if that's possible, um, where they have where other communities have been resettled and have them share their stories. Many times you'll find people sharing the sorts of stories that that are articulated in. Um, the Oral Testimonies that I was referring to earlier, um, which can give people real pause. And, uh, and secondly, at the end of the day, you have to also accept that we all have to accept this is the will of the community. And if, if compensation is the thing that they think has the ability to change their lives more than staying in their community, um, in their location, then that's also to be respected. Um, there's certainly lots of places where uh, the history of a village it might be a 500 year history of living in a particular site. There's others who've only moved to that particular site in the last 20 years. Um, so the connection they will have will be different. Um, I hope that helps. Great. Uh, the next question comes from Andre. Is there any criteria to better define, quote, relative proximity to a mining project in order to decide for the resettlement of the community? Uh, thanks, Andres. That's um, yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, I, I've just been working on a wind farm project and was very excited to discover that there is such a wonderful thing called a setback distance, and there's sort of parameters for which you can think through, and there are mathematical equations that you can calculate to to try and understand community safety impacts that helps you then determine what the relative proximity might be to a wind farm for houses um, or communities. Unfortunately, there is no real equivalent. For, for a mining community. I mean, I think from the point of view of the social and environmental impacts, certainly if there are noise and dust or air quality or water quality impacts that make it um, inappropriate for that community to stay, that, that's fairly straightforward. From a social point of view, if a community is sitting on a fence line, where is that? where should that fence line be put and is that right or wrong? Um, I think that's an incredibly difficult question to answer, partly because it depends on the history. Was the community already there and you're trying to minimise resettlement by maintaining as much um, of the community integrity as there was before? Or have people encroached to the area, in which case maybe you could think about buffer zones. There's some examples in Papua New Guinea where projects have tried to plant um, cash crops around the perimeter of their project. So the cash crop is protected by the community as an asset um, and speculators and, and communities won't be allowed to move into that area, creating some distance. But yeah, unfortunately I, I don't have the magic answer for that one. Um, but maybe there's some things to think about. Uh, the next question asks about uh, the similarities between the RAP. In, in the RAP, it, the part of the project impact is very similar with the impact assessment report, correct? Or, and is it different in that the RAP will be in much more detail in impact scale? So often in the uh, impact assessment report, the detail of exactly how a community or a, a community will be impacted is dealt with pretty much at the community level or at the village level. In a RAP, it has to go down to the household level. So it's not simply to say, um, this community will be resettled, but it's understanding the nature of the impacts, how many households will be impacted, what's the, if you're talking about a project that only resettles, let's say, 20 households, then you will go through the detail of exactly what's there. If you're talking about a community that might have a thousand households, then obviously you have to start working at a level of aggregation, but it's a much more um, detailed scale than you would put into the impact assessment. So depending on the timing of the impact assessment compared to the resettlement plan, hopefully the impact assessment can pick up the, the sorts of impacts. So for example, whether there's going to be a health impact, whether there's likely to be um, impacts around sort of future water usage, all those things that you would expect an impact assessment normally to look at. But it really does depend on how much detail of the anticipated resettlement is available at the time that the, the impact assessment is developed. Bosun asks, could this concept be applied to IDPs in Boko Haram, displaced areas in East Northeast Nigeria? Uh, Bosun, I, I would imagine the, the principles of how you manage resettlement 
um, are definitely applicable whether you're talking about IDPs um, in northeast Nigeria or whether you're talking about a, a mining project in central Mozambique. Um, the idea that you are trying to, or actually if you look at it, sort of obviously IFC standards are written predominantly for projects, but the World Bank standards are written for government-led um, projects. And, and many of them will be looking at how to manage um, or do look at how to manage issues related to IDPs. So yes, the principles are very much the same. The difference is, of course, who the entities are um, in terms of being able to implement them. And with a situation like you might find in northeastern Nigeria, there's a whole lot more considerations around um, what the, <laughs> the best case is that you can reasonably hope for in the situation that you're in. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I definitely the principles apply. Okay. Martin asks, would you agree that the preventative aspects of public health are often weak in RIPs because there is no specific health impact assessment undertaken by an expert in public health? I actually think this is a, a really uh, a perfect example of if you can align the timing of a resettlement program and an impact assessment program, then then yes, this is a this is a really interesting well, important point. So basically, the assessment of preventative aspects of public health is definitely best conducted by, conducted by health experts, either as an integrated part of an um, impact assessment or as a standalone health impact assessment. Resettlers, resettlement specialists are typically not um, health specialists. We might have um, a great interest and a particular fondness for, or even some academic background in it, but we're not standard health specialists normally. Um, and so by the same token, we won't necessarily know to look for something or recognize it when we see it um, from a health perspective that might be influenced by resettlement. So depending on the timing, of course, the iterative nature of impact assessment and resettlement planning gives you a good opportunity for an improved assessment if there's a coordinated and effective communication process between these two um, different fields. And one final question. How do you measure the success of livelihood restoration, especially when people have changed livelihoods before and after displacement? Wow, this is a, this is a huge question. Um, and to be honest, it deserves its own webinar. Um, apologies for having said that a few different times. But uh, the point is, well, in general, we look at how you measure um, the impact of displacement by you look at standard living indicators to assess physical displacement impacts and you look at livelihood restoration indicators to assess um, the management of economic displacement indicators. But asking people about their livelihoods uh, can be pretty complicated for a number of reasons, partly because many people won't know how to describe what their income is. They don't necessarily earn an income in terms of cash. Um, their income might be comprised of a number of different, maybe sort of lots of communities and lots of households you'll ask will say six or seven different things all contribute to their livelihood. Some subsistence activity of this, some small trade, maybe selling some cigarettes, the, the full range. And so summarising that for someone in a way that then can be used for comparison is pretty difficult. Secondly, there can be an incentive for people to slightly massage the information they give to you, um, either because they believe if they make their situation sound worse, they might get more compensation. Or if they make their situation sound better, they might be entitled to a different sort of compensation. Um, thirdly, I guess well, the point that we sort of tend to go back to with this is to address all of these things, you need to identify proxies. So you're not going to get a really good understanding of livelihood restoration and how successful it's been unless you can find things which people may not necessarily, which aren't necessarily the question you're trying to answer, but we give you an indication of the question. So for example, in particularly impoverished communities, you might say, what's the, uh, what would show that a community or a household has excess um, to bare minimum needs of income? And so uh, I know from a project in Papua New Guinea, after lots of work, and it takes lots of local content work, we end up discovering that it's when people are buying t-shirts that they're actually buying from a shop rather than waiting for those t-shirts to be handed out by the government or the latest NGO campaign. So when a shop bought t-shirt is normally a good indicator that a, that a household is a little bit above um, the bare minimum. 
Similarly, in other communities, it might be how much people are spending on mobile phone credit or uh, any number of things. So the point is really you need to understand the community you're in um, to be able to figure out what the proxies should be for that situation. Okay, well our time is up and I appreciate all of you for participating. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, we invite you to check out II's upcoming symposium on resettlement and livelihoods, which will be taking place in the Philippines in February 2017. There will also be, in conjunction with that symposium, three training courses. There's more information about that symposium on our website, as you can see on the slide. If you go to our website, iaia.org, and click on events and symposia, you'll find much more information on this event. We also are having an upcoming journal, uh, our IAPA journal, special issue in the beginning of 2017 related to resettlement, displacement, and livelihoods. So you'll want to watch for that. We encourage you to complete a very brief survey after the webinar ends. And please watch for an email next week with the link to the recording. Thanks again, Liz, for your presentation today. And thank you all for participating. Thank you.